It's a happy song, and so as you join the choir, we want to see the big smiles and the joyful sound. This is the day. This is the day. going to sing it again while you welcome and greet those around you, please. This is the day that the Lord has made. We want to rejoice in it by singing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Thank you, and you may be seated. <laughs> On such a beautiful day, it's a delight to welcome you and to thank you for being part of our worship time today. For our visitors, we extend to you a very, very special word of welcome and trust that the day will be a meaningful one indeed. By way of announcements, let me remind you, in your bulletin you will find the article about uh, sewing with Ethel, and she's here somewhere, I think. She left. Oh, she had to leave? Okay. But she'll be here tomorrow at the designated <coughs> time. And keep in mind, ladies, and I'm assuming that everyone that comes to sh Ethel's thing will be later, but anyway, it's, it, the, your sewing skills are not that important. I mean, somebody has to cut and somebody has to sew. 
They just don't explain it tomorrow. And so keep that in mind uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And then the opportunities on Wednesday evening. Uh, someone told me this past week, said, you know, our Wednesday evening service is my favorite service of the entire week. You won't understand that unless you come and find out what we do on Wednesday evening. And so we do invite you to be a part with us in that. Then you will notice that Ivan Parker will be here next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock for a concert with us. Ivan has been with us before, of course. And for you ladies, even if you don't like his singing, I mean, Linda likes to come just to look at the guy <laughs> while he's up there. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's worthwhile just to do that if for no other reason. But there's reason enough to hear him sing because he's the guy who sings midnight. Huh? The, midnight cry. the Midnight Cry. That's his sugar stick, and he'll sing it for us next Sunday night. Keep that in mind. And then the Lenten service tonight is at New Zion Baptist Church, which is going up 624, right there after you cross the, go around the bend. It's the black church there on the left, and that's where the Lenten service is tonight. Keep this, Ronnie, I think I'm going to let us stand right in, stay right in here at the end of the service, rather than losing some folks on the way back. Is that okay? What'd you say? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, pastor and wife have found a house that uh, they are going to lease, purchase, which means they're going to rent it for a while to see if they like what they see or have. It's on the road between here and Calio. Uh, but on Saturday, they're going to be here to clean around the house. It's been vacant for a little bit, but they are welcoming anyone who wants to come and help them in that effort. Washing windows, scrubbing floors, raking lawn, cutting grass, whatever, whatever. Ronnie, what's 8 o'clock, any time after 8 o'clock? Any time after 8 o'clock. This coming Saturday, just go on 360 <laughs> toward Calio. When you get to Bethany Baptist Church, go just a little bit and look on the left. It's a white two-story house. There'll be some sort of flag or sign or something, cars out there. This coming Saturday is very, very important. You don't have to have high skills to do this. I mean, even preachers can do this job. And so keep that in mind, and uh, it's... It'll be a big step down the road for them this coming Saturday. All right. Pardon? Yeah, cleaning supplies. If you've got a bucket or a spray or a rag or whatever, then bring it. Because there's nothing in the house. Absolutely nothing. All right. Birthdays over here. None. Over here. None, in the balcony. I see a hand, but who does it belong to? Jared had a birthday on Thursday. Jared Scott had a birthday on Thursday. Had. Had. Yeah. Will have. Will have. Okay. <laughs> Behind me, anniversary is any, yes, Gordon. Pat has enjoyed 23 years of Lennon's Glen. <laughs> <laughs> How many years, Gordon? Oh, today? Yesterday. Yes. <laughs> you were in the right ballpark. You just weren't on the right base, Gordon. But that's okay. That you remembered. That you remembered. That's good. All right. All right. No other anniversaries, birthdays. <coughs> Sweet 
We don't have the details on this. Some of you are aware of the fact already. Stanley Sanders, who has been sick and an invalid for a number of years, passed away yesterday afternoon, I believe. The family will go to the funeral home today to make arrangements. We were told that it'll be Wednesday night with Thursday or somewhere along that way. Tomorrow, it will, we'll have it here at the church, the information. We'll put it online. We'll try to get the word out. But to keep in mind, it will be sometime this week. And we'll take it from there, of course. Stanley Sanders. Stanley was a veteran and has been an invalid for a number of years. In addition, uh, as we gather here now, I don't, Margaret's not here, I don't say Margaret, but she has a son, Richard Henson, who is in MCV, who is waiting surgery, am I right? He's waiting surgery. Bobby Jewell, who usually sits right here with his wife, mm -hmm. Ann, has been in the hospital since uh, yes. Saturday, and he's in, Richard is in MCV, Bobby is in uh, Regional Memorial. And there are others, keep them in mind, aware of the needs at this particular time as we pray. Father, it's good to be in your house today on a beautiful, beautiful day like this. And I'm grateful for all who've taken advantage of it and who are here to sing your praises and to share in the worship time together. We pray that you will be with these families who have passed, who are passing through the valley of the shadow of death, that you will encourage and lift them up and provide strength and guidance and wisdom in such a time as this. Be very near, we pray to each and every one. Pray for those who are in the hospitals that you'll be with them and brighter days will be there for them in the days to come. So we commit the day to you. We ask your blessings upon all that's done in your name, not only in our church, but in other churches wherever, that the name of Jesus will be lifted up and many will be drawn to him. Pray for our people in the military, those who serve you in various ways, those who preach your word in churches throughout the <coughs> land and throughout the world, that today might be a good day for kingdom causes. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have noticed by this time that our focus on the day is on joy. And so we're going to stand and sing, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice, standing as we sing it together.
as we share in giving this morning, Ronnie will lead us in our prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, this is a day that you have made. We are so thankful for this beautiful spring day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunities you've given us to be a part of this day and to be gathered here in this place of worship. Father, we continue to pray for the Williamses, and we pray for the ministry within this church. We pray your blessings upon it and your direction to be with us and guide us and direct us through it. Father, we pray now that as we enter into this portion of the service, that you will take this offering, this blessing that you have so truly blessed us with, and multiply it and be used to further the thy government and the kingdom. Father, we pray and ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. You're aware that we try to um, maintain the theme in our worship services. I called Cindy this last past week or so and said, Cindy, the emphasis on Sunday is going to be on joy. She said, what about joy comes in the morning? I said, that will be wonderful. The choir's done it before but it's a favorite with some of us, and they will sing it again. Listen with your heart. Thank you. 
songs we never tire of hearing, right? And Joy Comes in the Morning happens to be one of those songs. Thank you, choir, for always the job that you do to add meaning to our service. As soon as they're seated, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 8. I'll read verses 1 through 8, but I need to comment on the opening statement when it says, begins, now Saul was consenting to his death. Now, to understand that statement, you need to go back into chapter 7 of the book of Acts, because that's where we have the account of the stoning of Stephen and his martyrdom. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Continuing. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And if we needed a text verse, then verse 8 would be the text verse. And there was great joy in that city. There is a truth in which I believe very deeply, or which I believe very deeply, and one I believe with all of my heart. And that truth is this. Christianity is a joyful religion. Now, sometimes when you stand up here and look out there, you might get the impression, well, preacher, that's not always the truth, but it is. Christianity is a joyful religion. I was aware of that, but it was brought home to me in a very vivid way some years ago when I was invited to take a trip to Taiwan simply to observe the country, the churches, the business, all that went on over there. And that's what we did. I don't know how I got, I do know how I was recruited, but anyhow, uh, I went along with, there were seven or eight ministers in the group, and we went to Taiwan for over a week. And we went to their business places, we went to their religious places, and all of that. The thing that I remember the most was when we visited one of the Buddhist uh, worship centers in Taiwan. And here was this massive structure in the middle of a, an area there. There were candles burning. There were statues there. There were people seated all around it. But they looked, every one of them looked as if this was their last moment on the face of this earth and as if they would not live to see another day. I do not remember seeing a smile from any of them. Their music was like a funeral dirge, and everything there was just without any hope or joy whatsoever. And this was the religion of the people who were there. We find that the Bible speaks often about the joy along this particular line. Let me simply remind you of some of them as we pass very quickly. When Jesus was born, you remember that the angels came from heaven and the Bible says that they sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
When the wise men came and presented their gifts, the Bible says that they rejoiced with exceeding joy. When our Lord arose from the grave on Easter morning and the women went to tell the disciples what they had experienced at the tomb, the Bible says they did so with great joy. When our Lord ascended into heaven, do you remember some of the disciples were standing there on the sides, taking it all in? And it says they went back to Jerusalem as they were commanded to do. And they did so with great joy. When the message of Jesus was shared with the Gentiles, we find that they continued in the temple, and the Bible says they did so, praising God and blessing him with great joy. When the message of Jesus was shared with the Gentiles, the Bible says there was great joy among all the brethren. In the parable of the, as found in the 15th chapter of Luke, when there was the lady with the lost coin, she found it and there was great joy. When in the second place, when we find that they, um, that the son came home, the Bible says there was great joy, and then the lost coin was discovered with great joy. The Bible, I contend, time after time, and again and again, reminds us of the joy that God expects of his children. This book which I hold in my hand is a book of joy. There are some sad things mentioned here, to, of course, but the Bible points out time and time and time again that God expects and wants his people to be a joyful people. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the joy, the secret of a joyful heart. You say, is there a secret? Can you take some medicine and have a joyful heart? Maybe so, I don't know. But I know the Bible has a whole lot to say about it. And as we do so, I would like to continue with a biblical example of express joy, when it happened and under the circumstances. We find that in the beginning of the early church, they were facing great difficulties because they were being persecuted for what was happening. I've just read, I mentioned, didn't read, but mentioned the death of Stephen who was stoned to death because of his commitment to Jesus and following him. Wanting to do something about that, we find that a man by the name of Saul went everywhere persecuting the Christians and putting them in jail and in some cases even killing them. The Saul to which I refer became Paul the apostle, because he himself met Jesus and had a transformation of heart and life. And so we find that the response of the early believers that was that they were a people of great joy. It says, the Bible says itself, they went everywhere professing what they had experienced and sharing the joy of the Lord. There was one man in particular who is mentioned in this chapter here. That man's name was Philip. And the Bible says that Philip went down to Samaria. And when he did so, he began to preach to the people in Samaria. You say, I didn't know Philip was a preacher. Well, he wasn't really. He was a layman. But he began to share good news with the people there in Samaria. And the Bible talks about the joy that came to those people because of what Philip had shared with them. Time and time again, from experience to experience to experience, the Bible talks about the joy among the people of God who had been, whose hearts had been touched by God's love, grace, and forgiveness. And so the question I want to answer try to answer this morning is a rather simple question. What is the secret to this kind of joy that the Bible talks about? I mean, can you get a pill 
to have this joy? Is there some exercise you can do to have this joy? What's the secret of this joy as expressed and stated and illustrated in the Bible? Well, when we began to check it out, we find exactly what God has to say about it and how the people had a joyful heart. Three things I want to share with you along this particular line. Based on what we find in the Bible, well, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, there was always joy among the people who were involved because God's plan was being followed. You remember when Jesus came and preached, the multitudes came. In fact, this passage here that I just read to you talks about Stephen going into Samaria and all of that, but some of the disciples remained at home. But as a result of this persecution, they went out into the community. And they went into other countries. They were driven there by the persecution that they were experiencing back in Jerusalem. But, comma, but, as they went, they began to share with the people with whom they were talking, the people with whom they were visiting, the people that they were coming in contact with. They began to tell them of what the Lord had done for them. And that was God's plan from the very beginning, that those of us who know and those of us who experience should share with others, tell them, invite them, reach out to them, whatever may be involved. There's a counterpoint to this, of course, in the Old Testament. We find in the early days of religion, not of Christianity, but in the early days of religion, that there were some people who wanted, decided that they needed to come together as a religious unit and worship their God, and they did so. And they built a wonderful, they built a tower, the Tower of Babel, and the people went there, and oh, it was wonderful, it was beautiful, and they all gathered there, and they were having a wonderful and glorious time. But then God did something. He said, this is not right. I don't want my people all gathered here around this tower enjoying one another. I want them to get out there and share it with others. And you know what he did? He confused their language so they couldn't talk to one another. And as a result of that, they had to go somewhere, and they went. And as they went, they began to share with others. And so we find in the Bible that it's God's plan when God's people begin to share and reach out and to try to win others to the Lord, that God blesses and it becomes a wonderful, wonderful event and experience. Alfred Luckett is a rather famous writer. I've shared the story on several occasions, but it fits what I'm talking about now and it illustrates perfectly what I'm trying to say of the little community alongside the sea and they decided since ships were going by and oftentimes they were involved in wrecks or disaster of one form or another. And so the people in that little community decided that they would uh, create or they would get together a life-saving crew, which they did. And they took the training and they bought the equipment and they built them a little shack down on the edge of the sea that they might run down there when there was an incident out in the water and they might go and try to help rescue the people and they were successful at it. And then they decided, well, this is a nice thing to do but maybe we ought to enlarge the facility, you know, and then the women could come and bring the children and we could have get-togethers down here and this, that and the other and they built the bigger facility. And it was enjoyed by all of the people. And things were going well, and they were still rescuing people and all of that. And they were going there and having this, that, and the other in their nice little facility. Until one day, the inevitable happened. 
and there was a shipwreck offshore, and they were all ran down there to where the equipment was and everything. But they'd been so busy doing things and having get-togethers and parties and all of that, no one knew how to do the equipment anymore. And as a result of that, people were lost in the wreck. Hear me when I say it because it's the gospel truth. If we're not careful, we can be so busy, you know, in what we do here that we forget there are a lot of people out there that still do not know our Lord and who need to come to him in the saving from sin. And so it is our challenge and our opportunity to follow God's plan and God's plan was followed in the New Testament. When the people didn't gather here, they went out there to where the needs were. Joy comes to the church when the church follows God's plan. In the second place, joy comes to the church when God's truth is being shared. The Bible says that when they preach, they preach the word of God to the people who had come to hear them speak. They shared Jesus with the people that had, with whom they had made acquaintance. The Bible says concerning Philip in this passage that I read earlier, that he went to Samaria. The Bible says he preached the word and Christ to those people. May I say something this morning that I believe with all of my heart. One of the reasons I believe that we are not reaching people as we should in this country is because there are pulpits in America today where the word of God and the gospel of Jesus and its purest form is not being shared from those pulpits. As a preacher, I'm standing here saying to you that in a lot of cases, the preachers are responsible for the failure because the word of God is not being preached as God says it ought to be preached. Do you realize, you may not even realize this, there are pulpits in America today where the name of Jesus is seldom mentioned from that pulpit. And we expect people to come to know the Lord as a result of that. If you don't believe that, I started to say, well, check the sermon topics in the newspaper on Saturday from time to time, but I don't think they even print them there anymore. But sometimes they did. Or when you're listening to whoever it is on the radio or on the television, and you'll hear preachers there who talk about everything under the sun, except that Jesus is the answer, that he died for their sins and rose again to live in their hearts. And unless that happens, then the gospel is going to wither up like a vine that has been cut and, and failed to produce fruit anymore. Hear me when I say it, that joy comes to the church when God's truth is being shared from the pulpit of that church. Now, I've only heard Keith Williams preach one sermon. But let me tell you, I've been blessed in hearing what that young, well, he is a young man to me. But anyway, when, when I heard him preach, I said to myself, this young guy, he's on target. He has told the committee, am I not right, Carl, that he is a preacher of the word of God. And this will be his theme and his focus. And if he will do that, and he will, and we will do our part, in sharing with others, inviting others, and doing whatever he can, we can, then I believe that God will bless in a very, very special way. I shall never forget, never forget. This was over 20 years ago before I was discovered at the dump. Over 20 years ago, we were living in, in Hare Hogan, and I don't know where we were going to church at that particular because we visited around. 
And I preached for, during that time, just about every Sunday, somewhere. But we, we were in a restaurant in Calio, Virginia. And there was a couple there from one of the local churches, the name of which I shall not mention. But there was a couple there that I have known, not in a buddy-buddy fashion, but I knew who they were, and they knew her, who we were. And we, and we asked them if, they, if we could share the table with them. They said, yes, come on. So we did, and we talked. And I apparently was in, in discussion with Cobham Park because during the time of that discussion, the lady asked what I was doing. And I told her I was preaching around, and, but they have invited me to come to Cobham Park to be the interim pastor. I'm going to quote that lady. She says, I know where that church is, but I haven't heard much about them. She, who lived within 12 miles of this church, knew the building was up here on the hill, but she hadn't heard much about them or us in due time. I hope that statement is never repeated. I know it's not repeated from that lady again, but I hope that's never said of us again. I believe, listen to me, I believe when Keith Williams starts preaching from this pulpit, I believe people are going to once again hear about Cobham Park Baptist Church and the preacher that they have here. Amen. Amen. You tell him I said that. It'll make him feel good when you see him. But anyway, they did what the, God blessed because God's truth was being shared, and it still needs to be shared. A third characteristic of the early church, joy was experienced because of God's power was experienced. The Bible speaks again of the fact that God's power was present among those people. In Samaria, we are told that God's power was involved in what uh, Philip was saying down there. And the result of that, in fact, it's in here. I read it in the text. The Bible talks about there were those who were healed of this and healed of that and transformed by this and transformed by that. God was at work, and wonderful, wonderful things were happening, and they will still happen. We are not beyond the day when the happenings can occur in the church, in various forms, of course. The Bible says also, and this is important as well, the Bible says also that the people there in Samaria they were of one accord in what they were doing. The one thing, hear me again, the one thing that will prevent God doing what he wants to do in this church as much as anything else is that there, if there are those who, you know, want my way, this way, that way, my thing, whatever, whatever, and fail to realize that God cannot bless as he wants to bless until the church is one as the body of Christ, of one accord. Does that mean we all got to dress alike, sing alike, talk alike, think alike? No. It means that we all have the same focus, and that's to lift up Jesus as Lord of life. And if that means me changing something sometime or not doing it my way or whatever, whatever, then so be it. But we're here to do God's will, not preacher's will or anyone else's will, but here to do what he wants us to do. And so when God's plan is followed, then God's blessing will be upon that fellowship. And so I go back to my original point, that God's plan for his people is that we do what he would have us to do, and we can do that when 
We are as one. The secret, keep this in mind, the secret of having a joyful heart is when God's power is present with God's people and they seek to do his will. Number two, the secret for having a joyful heart, God's power is experienced when his people respond in joy. Number three, God's joy is released when God's people are obedient to his will and not necessarily what I want or what someone else may want or my particular desire or whatever it may be. I close by sharing with you these truths in a very simple way. Our challenge today, number one, Jesus followers with joyful hearts. Can you smile while, while I, yes, thank you. All right, challenge, Jesus follows with a joyful heart. When God's will is obeyed, God's people are joyful. Number three, the, this, is the, this is the sermon. I should have put this one up and let you go at 25 minutes to 12. The secret of a joy, the joyful secret, happy-hearted followers of Jesus. The secret of a joyful heart is happy-hearted followers of Jesus. Amen. You're getting there. We're going to be ready if when uh, Williams gets here. Right, Gary? <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. It's been a good day. The people listen so attentively, and I pray they'll take it to heart and walk out of here preparing in their, prepared in their hearts to do your will and make this place a, people, a place where people have heard about it and will show up in great multitudes. We give you thanks and praise to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our service by singing our closing hymn, which is also our hymn of invitation and commitment by simply reminding us that we never go too far in our love for Jesus. More love, O Christ, to thee. May we stand, may we sing it together, please.